gentlemen, David Drake! This was <laughs> expensive. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Daughters on half rations uh, <laughs> for at least a season for this. Uh, so you guys, yeah, 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 get in there. Uh, <laughs> make this worth the food my daughter won't eat. <laughs> it's up to you. Every time you hear something not funny, remember there's a starving little girl <laughs> dependent on your laugh. So I don't wanna like put you in the hot seat or anything, but no pressure. <laughs> I, uh, hey, this is very exciting for me. I've been, I've been doing this unsuccessfully for 13 years. Thank you. Oh my. You guys excited about that? <laughs> Every day that goes by, I'm like, am I gonna make no money for a whole life? <laughs> like a bird? <laughs> or a lizard? <laughs> or a, a beetle? <laughs> yeah, here's where my career's at. I will, I'll do your podcast. <laughs> You got a podcast, I'm, all, I'm on it. You can't keep me off your podcast. I want on that podcast. I got this email the other day and it was like, hey Dave, you wanna do our podcast? I didn't even finish the email. I was like, yes, I'm doing your podcast. Of course, of course I'll be there. And then it's the night of the big podcast and I'm out with some of my best friends in the world and they have drugs. And, uh, and I say no to those, I'm like, I got, I got a podcast. And then I hop in a $40 Uber back to my apartment and I go into my daughter's bedroom and I pull open my laptop and I hit the Zoom link for the podcast and up pops the Zoom and I am face to face with three 15 year old boys. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I've agreed to do a child's podcast. <laughs> I podcasted with children for an hour and a half in my daughter's bedroom. And they didn't even really include me that much. <laughs> it was like kind of insidery, like they were like shitting on their history teacher and then occasionally I'd chime in like, yeah, yeah, yeah school blows. Take from me, the grown man you're hanging out with online. School sucks. <laughs> No, no, on school. Podcast ends because one of the kid's moms came into the bedroom and uh, she was like, hey, it's time for bed, so you gotta wrap it up, whatever it is you're doing. And then she looked at the computer screen where I am and I just shut my, I was like, no! I will not be looking a mother in the eyes tonight. Because like, even if she doesn't think I'm a predator, there's like no way to explain what I actually am. <laughs> oh, I'm a comedian, and I thought I could raise my comedy profile on your, uh, on your boy's podcast. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> you know, never mind. I groom children for sex on the internet. I prefer you think that than the horrible, awful truth what is actually going on in your son's bedroom. <laughs> yeah. Entertainment's all about who you know. And uh, I know three kids in Ohio. <laughs> yeah. I know 26 guys who all work for the same illegal moving company. <laughs> Entertainment's an amazing way to get into illegal residential moving. <laughs> uh, I, I do work for a moving company, uh, and it is illegal. We get paid under the table cash, uh, which is appealing to artists like myself, and then also hardened criminals. <laughs> uh, 
So I don't always love the guy I'm <laughs> working with. The guy I was working with last week, uh, he gets in the truck, immediately dives into his nightmare, awful life, which I didn't ask for. He just took it upon himself to reveal to me. He's like, man, I got these four kids, and uh, I had them from two different sex workers, and me and all four kids live in my mother's basement, and I'm currently in two custody battles with uh, both of those sex workers. And then the rest of the day is just complaining about these women. He's like, aren't, aren't these women crazy? Aren't they crazy? I'm like, hey man, you know what's crazy? <laughs> is that all the choices you've made in your life and all the choices I've made in my life have led us to the exact same place. That's what I find a little ha 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 crazy. Now your stupid story. That following your dreams can look so close to destroying your life. He also had a moving truck tattooed to his wrist. <laughs> I was like, hey, what's that about? He's like, oh, you know how like chefs have like a, like a knife? <laughs> Different thing, I don't know. A chef will tattoo a knife on his arm to show that, hey, I know how to cook. A mover will tattoo a truck on his arm to show, I don't know anything. <laughs> I can identify a box and then I, I know I had to put it on the, uh, on the uh, truck. <laughs> put on a truck. This box goes on a truck. One of those boxes. Here's how you make it in this business. Have a famous dad. Ooh. I have a friend, he has a famous dad, and now that friend is famous. That's the way to make it. I don't have a famous dad, but my father-in-law did just get fired from Panda Express <laughs> for refusing to stop adding his own spices that he brought from home to the food. His 17-year-old manager came up to him and was like, Hey, uh, we've been getting some complaints uh, that the food tastes kind of weird. Do you know anything about that? And then my father-in-law was like, yeah, I know a lot about that. <laughs> Revealed a full spice rack that he'd been dragging into work. And then the child had to be like, oh, what? And it became clear that my father-in-law thought he was a chef at Pan Express. And then a, a child had to be like, oh, no, 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 sir, did no one tell? Oh, no, this, this is not a restaurant. This is a trough for human beings. But we can't feed people like pigs, so we created the illusion of a restaurant. But the idea is the same. You scoop the slop onto the tray, you feed it to the animals that come in here, they roll around in it, mouth open, hoping some gets in. That is your job. My father lines, I think I see what you're saying. You want a little more everything bagel seasoning. I'm the Kung Pao chicken. I, I know what you're talking about. Fired his ass. Yeah. And uh, that guy's genes are uh, in my wife and now my daughter. <laughs> yeah, it carries on. Yeah. I feel a little weird making fun of my father-in-law. I've only met him twice. The, the first time was my wedding. Uh, I didn't know who he was and He's like, hey, I created wife. <laughs> and the second time, uh, he built a bunch of steps for my cat so the cat could walk up them and look out the window, which I did not ask him to do. <laughs> I just had a text on my phone from a number I didn't have, like, hey, I'm outside with the cat steps. <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> Both times he called me John. <laughs> which I don't know if you were paying attention. My name is Dave. <laughs> Not even close to John. John is the name of my wife's previous boyfriend. Ooh, bad boy. Don't know. 
it makes some sort of sick logic to me because like he's all right so this guy's had like 15 cats and they've all been named sam so he had one cat he named it sam that guy died and he's like i'm not gonna name any more cats. they're all sam now so i think he's applying cat logic to boys I'm just like, all cats are Sam, all boys are John, and all Kung Pao chicken should taste like spaghetti. This is the world I want. <laughs> My daughter, uh, she dipped her mac and cheese in her applesauce the other day. I was like, ah, oh, this is... It's coming fodder all over. <laughs> what the hell is this? Her wife lives in Kentucky. Both of our families live in like tiny, small towns. And they get so excited when we visit so they can show off the new restaurant. Forgetting that we live in New York City where there's like 100,000 restaurants. They're like, David, have you, have you ever heard of Caribbean food? Buckle up. We got one. It's run by this white guy named Bob. He makes the most amazing Caribbean-style hot dogs. You're gonna lose your mind, dude. Last time we were visiting her family, her Aunt Bon, she was, she was so excited. She comes running to the door like a dog. She's like, you're not gonna believe this. We got a tapas place here in Kentucky <laughs> where it's forbidden. It's amazing, David. Authentic Spanish tapas here. Better than Spain because it's here in Kentucky. And so I was like, all right, well, let's, let's go. And so uh, we hop in the car, we drive to the restaurant. And then my wife, as we're pulling into the parking lot, she's like, oh yeah, I know this place. This used to be a Buffalo Wild Wings. It's like, ooh, red flag. No Buffalo Wild Wings gets to become anything better than a Buffalo, you, only lateral moves. You're a Buffalo Wild Wings and then you're a Pan Express in the airport. You don't get to become an amazing tapas place. But I was like, I don't know, maybe I'm being like a New York snob about this, so like, let's go in and let's check it out. And so they give us a menu. First tapas on the menu. Uh, chips N dip. That's chips, big N apostrophe dip. Just like Barcelona. I can almost feel that Spanish wind blowing through my hair as I read the authentic Spanish top <laughs> spelling for chips and dip. Next tapas, loaded fries. Which I'm no tapas expert, but even I know that's pronounced patatas bravas. The brave potato. Tomato and mayo. Remember those kids in middle school, they dipped both mayo and ketchup? You had to be brave. You knew kids were gonna make fun of you, but you did it anyway, because you're brave. Patatas bravas. Brave potato. Third tapas. Now this is, uh, probably shouldn't do this. It is a uh, recording, but uh, I'm gonna open this one up to the room. Who thinks they know what the third tapas was? We got, oh. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> right off the bat. We have a half dozen Tapa style wings. Ooh, Aunt Bon. I think we are at a very sneaky Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> This feels like the Buffalo Wild Wings equivalent of three kids in a trench coat trying to sneak into a movie. Hey, we're a tapas place. We're not a Buffalo Wild Wings. Our special tonight is, of course, a bucket of Buffalo Wings. Tapas style. What is tapas style? Oh, that's a 48 ounce margarita you can drink out of a sombrero. Because we know what tapas are. They're Mexican. <laughs> and we know that. Uh, 
They just got a, a Trader Joe's, and Bob was really excited and uh, to, to take us, get some authentic Trader Juan tortillas. <laughs> yeah. I go, to, I go to Trader Joe's all the time, and uh, I, was, uh, I was in Trader Joe's the other day, and I was standing in line, and then I got to the end where they had like the cashier assignment man, which is not a job and should not be a job. <laughs> I understand we're trying to get as many of our buddies into grocery store summer camp as we can, but this is a TV, not a job. Uh, we've all seen this work perfectly fine with a TV that just says the cash register, and then no one has to hold up a canoe paddle as an adult. Because adults work here. And we're trying to make people less sad. Whatever. We haven't fixed this problem yet, so today this is a guy. And so I get to the end, and he's like, hey, uh, a cash register will be ready for you soon. And then there wasn't. And he was just standing there, and he's looking around, he's starting to freak out, he's starting to sweat, because he feels like he has to say something to me. Which if you ever don't have something to say to somebody, you don't have to say anything. Nobody cares, no one's gonna be mad. No one's going home and I like, man, I wish more people I don't know said shit to me today. It's fine, just don't say anything. But he feels he must say something. So he starts looking around, he doesn't have anything to say. He's like, what do I say? And then he looks at, he looks at me and he looks at my grocery cart and he's running out of time. So he's just like, ah, good, good job with the groceries. <laughs> It's like, what? You got all your groceries on top of the basket and you didn't, you didn't have to use the, the bottom of the basket at all. And I let him sit in that for like a minute. I was like, yeah, yeah, this is the amount of groceries I wanted, so I, I didn't need to use the, I'm explaining want and not have to, that's why if you don't have anything to say to anybody, don't say something, because you start sounding like children. You know, and, oh, you got all your groceries in the basket. Yeah, my jacket zips all the way up. <laughs> I can run really, really fast. My mom says I shouldn't, but I can. I sometimes do. Don't have anything to say, don't say anything. Because uh, it's a loud city, shut the fuck up. <laughs> don't say anything. Because when you don't say anything, I look at your face and I'm like, who, who is this guy? Who's this mysterious man? What's going on behind those glassy eyes? Is he a genius? Is he a great man? Oh, you got all your groceries in the back, oh! He's a fucking idiot. Why would I ever think Anything but that. Second story involving this same man. <laughs> it's my Trader Joe's, I go there all the time. So I see this guy all the time. He doesn't know who I am, but we all know who he is because like, you know, he sees 25,000 people a day and, uh, and we just see the one guy. He's like o Obama. <laughs> I feel like that's a valid. <laughs> He's grocery store Obama. So I come a different day, I get there, and he's like, hey, welcome to Trader Joe's. Did you find everything you were looking for? And then I said, does anybody ever really find what they're looking for? <laughs> Which, all right, fuck me, now I'm the villain of this. Like, why did I, s shut up, just say, yeah. Does anybody really find what they're looking for? And now he's like, got darkness. <laughs> I don't think so. I didn't find what I was looking for. Luckily this day, the cash register is ready almost immediately. So he's like, go there, and then I go and I ring out. And then I, uh, on my way out, I decide to use the Trader Joe's uh, bathroom. So I go in there, Lord knows what I do in there, but <laughs> just use your imagination. Yeah. 
I, uh, I wash, it's three things. <laughs> I wash my hands, I'm gonna stop talking about it. <laughs> I keep doing that. I'm washing my hands, and as I'm washing my hands, the oldest, most <laughs> crippled man in the world hobbles into the bathroom. He goes into one of the stalls, immediately falls off the toilet, and is now moaning for help, half naked, on the ground. And I'm so depressed. I'm like, because I was almost out of there. I was like, thinking through all the things I did to leave me, like if I just didn't ring up apples, I'd be out in the world, no idea. This naked old man is dying on a Trader Joe's floor. But now I'm like the guy in there that has to like do something, so I, This is a situation that requires a hero. Like a real hero, not like a, like a movie hero where you have powers and you're trying to save the world. This requires a true hero, someone who's willing to go into this stall and help this naked man back onto the toilet in his ultimate moment of vulnerability. So, I leave the bathroom to find <laughs> one of those guys. Certainly there's one of those drifting around this Trader Joe's. The man I run into first is the cashier assignment man. And he says to me, hey, still looking for something? And I go, yeah. There's a naked guy in the bathroom. You gotta get him back on this toilet. <laughs> and then he said, oh, fuck. <laughs> Which if you've ever been to Trader Joe's, you know this has never had, like, anytime you come to an employee at Trader Joe's with a problem, they drop everything. They're like, you have a problem? Not anymore. I'm gonna solve your problem, and then we are best friends. We're going out, I got a hall pass from your wife, we're gonna meet women. She wants you to meet women. I'm like, hey, you gotta get a naked guy back on the toilet. He's like, I should've just taken that job with my uncle. But I'll tell you what, this guy knows me now. Every time he sees me coming into that line, he's like, man, this job should just be a TV. I don't... No more small talk, just a little shuffling of the feet. Which is what I like from my, from everyone. I've lived in New York for seven years. Like, no one, you're not supposed to see anybody, let alone talk to them. You ever see someone's face? <laughs> and then they see you see their face. You have to pretend like it was a mistake. Like, oh! I'm sorry. I saw you by mistake. Didn't mean to look at it. I haven't seen a human face in seven years. See something, say nothing. That's what it should be. I've never seen anything and thought to say something. I was on the train and there was a guy smoking a cigarette right across from me. Never once did it occur to me, oh, you should say something. <laughs> hey, that's illegal. Uh, yeah, I'm fucking crazy. <laughs> and I'll kill you. <laughs> Back to the phone. Back to the phone. Oh no. I got caught looking at this guy's weird hand on the train the other day. All his fingers were fused into this, like, flipper. Never seen anything like that. You don't want to look, you know what I mean, you want to you wanna be nice and you don't want to look, but like, you're still an animal. So you see a thing like that and you're like, what, the, what is, that's not hands. What is that? Is it food? Is it a threat? What is it? There's some other thing going on. You don't mean to look at the guy's weird hand. You just got, a, you're an animal. 
So he saw me looking at his hand, and then he said, what the fuck are you looking at? And I wanted to be like, oh man, you know what you got. You got a turtle hand, and you're a person. If I had a giraffe face, I'm gonna give people two seconds to acclimate to new weird shit they've never seen. But of course he said that, and I was like, ah, the, the ceiling of the train is the thing I want. There it is. Did not mean to see the most interesting thing I've seen all week. Wouldn't want to work, look at that. That's why I love bringing my daughter on the train, because you know kids, they'll stare at you, and they, they will stare. Like they know your whole life, and they're disappointed. I've seen my daughter break people on the train. Where like, she just look, and they're like, how'd she know? <laughs> what the hell? Sometimes I'll bring my daughter on the train and she will just start screaming at a guy. Like she just doesn't like it. And I always kind of agree with <laughs> her choice. I'm like, hey honey, we don't scream at people on the, uh, yeah, yeah, all right. That is tough to look at. <laughs> that one's rough. Not where eyes should be. She screams a lot. She has night terrors, because uh, she doesn't know what, what nightmares are. So they happen and she wakes up screaming. Uh, which, hey, you know, we all know what nightmares are. You know what I mean? Like you have, you have them all the time. You know what they are. You have some context for a nightmare. Like, you're asleep and then all your teeth fall out and then you go to scream, but nothing comes up but, but flies. And then you wake up and you're like, oh, that was, that was crazy. Well, time for work. And then you go to work. My daughter, she has no context for nightmares. So she has a nightmare and then that happened. So she is screaming because <laughs> she was just being eaten by spiders. <laughs> and then I come in and try to console her back to sleep. Like, eh, get back in there. <laughs> come on, get eaten by spiders. That's the deal. You want to be a person here on Earth? You get eaten by spiders every once in a while. Every time you close your eyes, three out of five times, you're either eaten by spiders or the bodega guy fucks your wife. You never know what you're going to get. The only thing that's certain is that this will keep happening for your entire life. And maybe even a little after. Because what is death but forever sleep? And this shit's happening now when sleep is this? I can't imagine the nightmare of death. But anyway, get back to sleep. Sweet little angel. That's all I want. Yeah, she screams when she's awake too, just for no reason at all. And uh, every time she screams and my wife is home, she'll come bursting, what, what's going on? What's happening? And I'm always like, nothing. It's a baby. I went in the closet for one second, she thought I disappeared forever. She's, she's dumb. She, not a, I do this and she thinks I have no face. Oh, face is bad. Baby. I'm trying to get my wife to stop reacting that way because I feel like it's time for my daughter to learn the very, very important lesson that you can cry and cry and cry and cry, but nobody is coming. <laughs> A lesson that is still relevant today. I would kick and cry and scream and fight if I thought any of you could help me. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> all you do is fuck up the special. <laughs> He went for it and <laughs> missed it again. Yeah, that's right. Oh, God. All right. I was looking at it like a... All right. You got it. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't have had a family. 
<laughs> like, when I first met my wife, I feel like the city of New Orleans. Because, like, when we first met, there was, like, singing and dancing and laughing and playing. And uh, every day that goes by, the more she starts eyeing those levees, like, <laughs> Wait, this is a city built on the sea below sea level? <laughs> What's, this is, was there no plan? What is the plan? Da! Ah, I'm a fun guy. I'm fun. What are you gonna do to make money for our daughter? Ah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to the bowling alley. Talk about you. <laughs> it's her fault. She married fun. Never marry fun. You visit fun. You go to Six Flags. And then you go back to your home. Your life. You don't try to put roots down at Six Flags. You don't live at Six Flags. My wife married Six Flags, and now she's mad that the fridge is full of corn dogs. She's like, what, what the hell's going on? Why is it Six Flags, not a house? <laughs> well, is it a Six Flags? I don't know. Yeah, I have no money. If you saw my bank account, <laughs> you'd be like, all right, this guy, this guy is pro-life for sure. No one would bring a new life into this world in the red. Yeah. Really like that phrase, pro-life. Mm -hmm. Does that sound kind of nice? Sounds like something you say when you're real high, just 420 friendly, pro-life, hell yeah, man. I love life. Life is sick. Conservative branding is chill as hell. Like, if you just took those phrases and put them in a void, just, hey, man, pro-life, all lives matter. I just want to be free. Yeah. <laughs> put those phrases in a void and, like, who is that guy? Like, I don't know, <laughs> Cheech and Chong is <laughs> my best friend. Oh, no, 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 that's a Nazi. <laughs> All those words. I like that guy. Yeah. I, uh, I am pro-choice, but I understand that it's a complicated issue. Uh, when my wife was in labor, uh, the doctor at some point brought her into a small little room and was like, had her fill out some paperwork that basically said, hey, in the event of some sort of emergency where we have to choose between your life or the baby's life, which one would you like us to choose? And then my wife chose the baby's life. And I just think that's so messed up that they asked her that. You know what I mean? Like, like they should ask me that, right? I'm the one who has to live with the winner of... Dave, who would you rather live with? This woman who you very publicly vowed to love until the end of time, or this random baby with your grandpa's eyes? Yeah. Wife. Always wife. Like, all right, I came home the other day and I had keys and I had no, I had no place to put them. And my wife saw that, and now there's little hooks all over the house. <laughs> baby would never have figured that out. Wife is very good at identifying and solving problems. <laughs> Baby was blind for like six months. Yeah. All right, very, very sad scenario. If my daughter did not make it. Oh no. Now I am this guy without a baby, which is probably what I should be. <laughs> I did 35 years, no baby. Goddamn, if I couldn't do it again. <laughs> Same scenario, no wife. All right, now this is just this guy and a baby, which we've established, this is not a job that I'm doing. 
You can't feed a baby drink tickets from the bowling alley. <laughs> So day one of no wife, all right, now me and the baby are moving in with my parents right outside of Boston. And I've got this 13 year comedy gap in my professional resume. So I can't get a job like you guys. I have to get some sort of blue collar C work like lobster hunting or scallop shucking. And then I'll probably end up with some lobstery Boston townie with the shittiest, worst accent in the whole world. Did she catch a lot of lobster today, David? Did she get a lot of lobster? I don't know, Charlene. I, uh, I got some lobsters. I, I don't know if it's a lot of them. Why do you still talk like this? How does the Boston accent survive this world? You've seen TV. How did the Boston accent survive the information age? Oh, fuck you, you fucking queer. This voice is whole <laughs> That's my life. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm dating a cigarette. I'm living with my parents. <laughs> hunting sea bugs. That's the life my wife signed me up for. Not fair. I didn't get to sign any paperwork like, hey Dave, what do, you, what do you want to happen to your wife when you die? I want her to work at a Best Buy in Cleveland. <laughs> That's what I want. Yeah. <laughs> I just heard my wife protest. <laughs> I've got a wife here. <laughs> How good of a wife to come to a show like this, hear those things. That's a lovely wife. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> a lovely wife who made me forget the whole second half of this. <laughs> All right, we've acknowledged how lovely you are. Now, you know, no more heckling. I also don't know where you are. I keep looking at this one guy. As if, oh, okay. <laughs> This is one guy with <laughs> light reflecting off his glasses, and that became my wife. <laughs> For the bit. No, I mean, and very selfish of my wife to choose that. Like, you get to die the young, beautiful hero? Okay, you don't think I want that? I'm not contributing anything to the family. I, I failed. I would love to die for my family. And everyone thinks of me as like, oh, Dave, he gave his life for his family. They're all proud of me for the first time. I would take a bullet for my family. Right? I didn't, they don't even have to be anywhere near the bullet. I will run across a gun range for my family. This is America. I will run across a high school for my family. <laughs> school sucks, right? <laughs> now, I can't be a dad, a single dad. I mean, I, I've been calling the pediatrician a podiatrist for a year and a half. <laughs> we need a wife. If it's just me, will she graduate? Uh, no. Will she do Molly at homecoming? Hell yeah. I'll sell it to her. Daddy needs the cash. Yeah. <laughs> I am like an aging drug guy, uh, which is, uh, <laughs> feels a little weird now because all my friends are dads, so like we're all sitting in the same bathroom stall with our hand in a bag, just like, oh my god, Kelsey's walking? That's incredible. Is this enough, Molly, or not enough, or what, what is that? Sometimes we'll be <laughs> doing drugs in a stall right next to another stall full of 20-year-olds doing drugs, and they get all loud and crazy, and I feel all dad about it. Like, hey, this isn't a frat house. This is a restroom in a Chili's. There are families here. My, my family, my family's here. Don't tell my wife. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, yeah I picked up smoking when my daughter was born. Uh, we all deal with it differently. You know? 
My wife, she ran the New York City Marathon. She's like, I had a baby, I can do anything. I'm running the marathon. I was like, that's awesome. I can, I'm gonna smoke cigarettes. <laughs> so I feel like it's the same thing. I feel like running the marathon is worse for your body than smoking cigarettes. I have nothing to back this up, but uh, does not feel true. Marathon, cigarettes at the knees. That's, that's what that is. Yeah. I do worry about smoking because uh, like, I've had like teeth problems like my whole life. I just got like a cavity filled the other day. I think that's the last one. I, th I don't think I have to go anymore, actually. <laughs> when your teeth are bad, you have to go to the dentist all the time. When they are really bad, you never have to go ever again. Yeah, yeah, no, it's all right, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> no one's made such a calamitous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's all right, we forced you here. So that's what you get when you, when you force a front row. <laughs> you don't get the, <laughs> the top. You get the people that should have been in the back that <laughs> were bribed with drink tickets. <laughs> Which of course leads to stumbling. Uh, for... Thank you for coming to the show. <laughs> Teeth. <laughs> oh, it's, it's so funny, like, teeth, like, teeth should just keep falling out and growing back. Right? They already did it once. Just keep doing it. Like lizard tails. You get nervous and they, oh. They're back. It's crazy. You get your adult teeth when you're seven years old. <laughs> okay. <laughs> seven years old. Like, if you're gonna get your adult teeth at seven, you should at least stop telling kids about the tooth fairy. You know what I mean? Because, like, I feel like it sets a bad example for a teeth. Like, your tooth falls out, you're like, oh, yay! Money! When your tooth falls out, you should be like, oh, no. My tooth fell out. Oh, God. I've lost a tooth. When my daughter's teeth fall out, she, she will be punished. <laughs> Is this a tooth on the floor? Get to the corner. You know what you did. Oh, Dad, what about the tooth fairy? There is no tooth fairy. And if there was, I wouldn't let that thing near you. It's a fairy that buys children's teeth. No daughter of mine is selling her body to some pervert fairy like a harlot. Yeah. Santa's cool though. You can <laughs> you can believe in Santa. The message is right. You do nice things and you get a toy. He's not all tooth fairy about it. Like, <laughs> give me an ear, I'll give you this boat. <laughs> Here's how toxic the tooth fairy is. When when my wife was like six years old, uh, she uh, accidentally swallowed one of her baby teeth. And then uh, her mom felt so bad about that. So that night, instead of the customary $1, the tooth fairy gave her $20. And then my wife proceeded to swallow the rest of her baby teeth. <laughs> Santa would never make, make you eat your own face for more gifts. That's like a tooth thing. I have a friend, she's got kids and she's not telling her kids about Santa because she doesn't want to lie to her kids. She's like, I don't want to lie to my kids. It's like, what? You're just gonna tell them what's going on? That feels way worse than... <laughs> Where's grandpa? Grandpa's dead. Well, what's dead? Oh, well, uh, what's dead? Well, statistically, at some point in your life, uh, you'll have a heart attack, or you'll be murdered in the mall. And then you'll be dead. And uh, there's not a lot of facts, but the thing that makes the most sense is it's probably just a dark nothing forever. 
and uh, within a single lifetime, everyone on Earth will forget uh, you ever were. <laughs> oh, also, while I have you here, there's no Santa. I don't want you to think I'm one of those shitty liar parents that lies <laughs> about Santa messes up their kids. No, you gotta lie to your kids. It's the, it's the best part. You get to lie to an idiot? Are you kidding me? They don't know anything, and then you can say anything, and that's what they know. That's... Come on, you're not gonna prank that? Not even once? I ate all my daughter's goldfish the other day, and she's like, where were the gold... I gaslit her immediately. <laughs> where are goldfish? I was like, you ate your goldfish. <laughs> if there's no goldfish, it's because you did something. She was like, oh, no! I was like, oh, yeah. You got a problem. Not yet. <laughs> That's so mean, she says. I, uh, none of you applauded when uh, <laughs> kids were brought up earlier, so uh, you guys don't really care. <laughs> I can't believe you did that thing that I don't ever want her. Ever. I, uh, I lie to my daughter all the time, and I don't even think about it anymore. She saw an airplane for the first time. There. She's like, wah, wah, wah. I was like, sandwich. I didn't even... <laughs> I didn't think. To, I just said, yeah, that's a sandwich. And now every time she sees a plane, she's like, oh, sandwich. My heart is full. Because <laughs> she's just going to think airplanes are sandwiches until somebody corrects her. I don't know when. She's going to be like six years old on the playground, see a plane. Oh, sandwich. And then the kids are like, what are, are you an idiot? What are you talking about? Oh, no. And she's gonna run home. Oh, Dad, you lied to me. <laughs> like, yes, I lied. It's, I lied to you because it's an important lesson. It, lying is one of the greatest things you can do in your, in your life. You see, honey, every day I go into work and I ask my coworker, hey, how's it going? And he always says, great. Now, sweetheart, I know that my coworker's life is a living, breathing hell. <laughs> He's got four kids from two different sex workers. Living in his mother's basement. But he knows I don't want to talk about that shit every single day. So he lies selflessly to my face. Because he is a great man. Lying is one of the nicest things you can do. Now brush your teeth or Santa will die. My parents lied to me all the time. I, re I remember the, the last time I trusted my parents. I was 12 years old, we were in a restaurant, and there was a band playing, but no dance floor, all right? So this is a band playing in a restaurant, all right? There's a restaurant with people eating, and there just happens to be a band playing. So the band is playing, and then my mother, she points out a 12-year-old girl sitting across the room at a table with her family, and she's like, hey, Dave, you should ask that girl to dance. And I looked around, and I knew in my heart, no. <laughs> That's insane. So I said, no, Mom, I'm not going to ask that girl to dance. And then she said, David, if you don't ask that girl to dance, you're going to regret that for the rest of your life. <laughs> I was like, well, I don't want to regret it. I'm sorry. I don't want to have regrets. So I stood up, and I walked over to a child eating dinner with her family in a restaurant with no dancing. And I tapped her on the shoulder and I said, hey, would you like to dance? And her grandmother and her father and her uncle are, are like, <laughs> he's an idiot. This is ridiculous. Dan dance with the boy. She's like, I don't wanna di dance with the boy. And now we're two children touching each other in the middle of a restaurant with no dancing. And my mom was right, I have regretted that for uh, my entire life. K 
can't trust those people. It's crazy I'm in charge of like knowledge giving. I don't know if my daughter is learning anything because she like, she just speaks gibberish. She's like, bop a out. And then I just repeat it back. I'm like, bop a out. She is trying her hardest to learn the English language from scratch. I'm doing nothing. Imagine if you went into your French class, you're trying to learn French, and the teacher's like, bonjour. And you're like, bop a out. And then the teacher is like, perfect. That's great. And then you go to France. And you have no friends. Because <laughs> you didn't really learn French, did you? You learned nothing. But whatever, man. I'm a, I'm a dad, so you don't really have to teach me anything. The bar is low for fathers. Like, people just like when I'm out with her. That's kind of like it. People get so excited when they see me out with my daughter. Like, oh my God, a man out with a with a with a baby! Incredible. He could have left, but he, here he is. He stayed with his family. I was on the swing with my daughter the other day, and we we're just like swinging back and forth. And then these two old women came onto the playground. They're just like, "Hey, sorry to interrupt. I, just so you know, you are amazing." I was like, oh my god, I, I am so high. I'm amazing. I'm an amazing man. People do not treat my wife the same way when she is out with our daughter. They, uh, they spit at her and they <laughs> try to trip her. Get out of here! A woman with a child. Because, be, like, you know, being a woman with a kid is nothing new. Like, being a dad was invented, like, three years ago. <laughs> Truly. Like, I grew up in the 80s, and, like, the highest grossing comedy of 83, when I, you know, was uh, a movie called Mr. Mom, which is a movie about a uh, guy uh, who had to stay home with the kids because his wife uh, got a job. Hilarious comedy. <laughs> they didn't even have a word for that. They're like, he's a, he's a man, but, he, but he's a mom. He's a man. Man, man, mom. No. M Mr. Mom. Mr. Mom. <laughs> Highest grossing comedy of 83. People would like tell their friends about it. They're like, you're not going to believe. <laughs> I don't know how Hollywood thinks of it. He's, he's a man. He's not, he's not a man. Uh, he's, a, he's a mom. <laughs> it was laundry. Hmm. Yeah, I've got a bit of a Mr. Mom thing going. Uh, <laughs> wife works in an office, and I, uh, you know, <laughs> do not. So I'm always on the playground with my daughter, which is great, but sometimes my daughter will drift a little too far away, and then I go from being a hero father uh, to an alone man on the playground. <laughs> Nobody likes this guy. Ooh, that's a threat. What's scary to me is like other kids from other families will come up and try to play with you. They're like, hey, do you want to play? And I'm like, no. <laughs> and they're like, oh, why? I'm like, I, I can't even begin to explain <laughs> the horrors of the <laughs> world you've been dragged into. Just, just trust me. Don't, don't trust anyone. Just tr tr stay. Go. Go. I was on the playground with uh, my daughter the other day, and uh, I just overheard these, like, three little girls. Uh, they were just, like, chatting with each other. And then I heard one of the girls say to the other girls, she said, hey, do you girls want to play sad girl? I was like, ooh, what, what is sad girl? So I watched them play. And here's what Sad Girl is. It's a made up game made up by little girls. And here's how you play. Two of the girls run around and dance and play and laugh and have fun. And then the third girl is the sad girl. And it's her job to sit underneath the playscape with the saddest, most broken look on her face while her friends dance and play around her. 
And it's unclear how you score a point. <laughs> in Sad Girl. But one of the girls will carry the weight of this day well into their late 40s. <laughs> yeah. So it's so funny, because like, I was like a little boy, and I would play little boy games. Like, like we play catch, you throw, throw a ball, catch. <laughs> catch the ball. And then I guess at the same time, uh, the girls were engaged in some sort of social hunger games. <laughs> Hey, let's play Break Sarah. Ooh! I love Break Sarah. Me, 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 me. It's just so funny, because like, I was friends with like mean, vicious little boys, and still, it never occurred to any of us that you could just like leave one out. We're never like, hey, you want to play Sad Boy? Hey, crack, go sit in the closet while me and Jeremy play video games. Yeah, sit in the dark and listen to us laugh and play. You can come out when you've forgotten how to trust. So you know the game is over. My one goal as a father is my daughter will never play this game. I don't care about anything else. I don't care about drugs. I don't care about boys. I could catch her doing cocaine off a gun. I'd be like, hey, this isn't sad, girl, is it? Everyone's including you? Is it loaded? No, all right, well, carry on. Not too late, we got kindergarten in the morning. Can't be doing that. I've been waiting for something fucked up to happen on the playground for like a year. Because it's like, New York City playgrounds, I mean, none of you have chil children, but you can imagine. It's hell on earth. There's always like one thing off on New York City playgrounds. It's like children playing and then one guy doing karate. <laughs> or like children playing and then a, like one loose dog. <laughs> no visible owner. Yeah, who is that? whose dog is that? So I've been, I've been waiting for something to happen. Finally it did, finally. I, I was playing with my daughter, and, and then uh, I just noticed like there was like a can guy, which we all know can guy. He's a, he's a guy who goes to the trash, and he takes the trash, and he puts it into his private trash. <laughs> and he's trash his own. Can man, we know him, we love him. So I saw him kind of playing around. I was playing with my daughter, and I just kind of noticed him in my peripheral. Didn't really think much of it, because it's so common. Uh, then I look up again, minutes later, and he is putting two bags of cans into my stroller, and he is leaving the playground. <laughs> Which none of you know, but a stroller is the most expensive part of my life. <laughs> and it's also kind of intimate. It's my daughter's home, away from home. <laughs> this man has just covered my daughter's home in trash and is leaving with her home. So I run after him, and I, I'm like, hey, what are you doing? And then he turns around, and he's like, ah! And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize you were insane. I thought you were just a, like a normal guy making a mistake, uh, but, but you're crazy. This particular situation is where I think we could really use a Karen. We've all heard Karens. It's not all talking to the manager. Sometimes some crazy man puts a bunch of cans into your stroller and he's leaving the playground and you just need one upset white woman who's willing to risk it all. <laughs> Luckily, the playground is chock full of these women. <laughs> yeah. This man is leaving the playground, and I'm already, like, mentally prepared to, like, tell my wife, <laughs> Ah, we lost the stroller. <laughs> Cam guy got it. It's cans. It's all cans.
when from out of nowhere, a woman, unrelated to me, unrelated to any of this, comes up, she starts screaming crazy shit at this guy, and he gets so freaked out, he takes the cans, and uh, I get my stroller back, and I got the whole thing on my phone, I posted it to TikTok, she will never work in PR again. But that's the sacrifices women make to be a, to be a hero. It, usually on playgrounds, it's just kind of like me and then like a bunch of like nannies. It's like me and then nannies. And, uh, and I, was, I was hanging out with this other nanny. This, or this, well, she's a nanny, I'm not a nanny. I'm a dad. I'm a father. This one's mine. We were hanging out, and then she called over this, like, her friend, like, who's, like, this au pair. She's like, she's like, hey, come, come meet Dave. He's just, like, he's just like a guy. He's not making any money. To, he's just, he's bleeding cash here on the playground. Come, come meet Dave. So she calls over this, like, 26-year-old au pair who starts walking over, and she is dressed like she is auditioning for the part of my affair. Uh, <laughs> it's not a full French maid outfit, but it's some clothes. And she comes up, and she is from France, and she starts talking to me, and she just starts grilling me about my marriage. And uh, I'm gonna do her voice now, but I, she's not like handicapped or anything. I, I'm just not very good at the French accent. Yeah. She's like, David, uh, do you love your wife? I'm like, who sent you? Do I love my Who sent this porn category to fuck with my... Do I love my wife? Yes. She kept asking him questions like that. It felt like in Jurassic Park where the raptors are testing the fence for weed. <laughs> Do you love your wife? <laughs> she, she got me with this one. She's like, ah, David, uh, do you ever go to look at your wife? And you find that when you turn to look, she is already uh, gazing back at you. Are you asking if me and my wife look at each other? <laughs> like, no, not in the way that we're not, we don't gaze. It's like, it's like when a cat gets too close to a, a, a strange cat. Like, we both get big. We get a, <laughs> scare them off. No gazing. <laughs> we don't gaze. We've been, we've been together for like 11 years. We've been married for six. We've been, two of those were a pandemic. We've been, so we've been married for like 60 years. Yeah. So we don't, you don't gaze anymore. I don't, I don't know what my wife sees when she looks at me. But it's, it's not like a, a sexual. She doesn't see what you guys see. <laughs> so her, this is like a green screen. It's, she's like, wow, more wallpaper. The, the wallpaper's talking. I know this because she caught me giving girl advice the other day on the phone. And, uh, and then I hung up and she's like, why are you giving girl advice? I'm like, I don't know, exhibit, I got one. I have a wife and a daughter. My girls got girls. I'm printing them at home. Who better to ask than a man who makes girls in his own apartment? Who are you gonna ask, some single idiot? Here, listen, if you wanna know how to bake a cake, you ask a guy who's baked a cake. You don't ask some dumbass who's fucked up 20 cakes and all. Half the cakes are mad. <laughs> you talk to Paul Hollywood. <laughs> you 
No, I mean, you date long enough, you just see shit that you shouldn't see, and that's why you don't gaze. Like, we, the whole family, together, as a family, had food poisoning. So, like... <laughs> Which is messed up because like when your daughter and you both have food poisoning, uh, you still have to care about her, <laughs> which is insane. <laughs> like my, I've never cared about my daughter less than when we all had food. <laughs> she could have been like, crawling into a wood chipper. I'd be like, ah. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to stay on the toilet while I throw up into the sink. I don't care if you're wood chips. It'd be better. It'd be better if you're wood chips. Wood chips don't go anywhere. Just one pile of daughter. Yes. <laughs> Here's how crazy it is. I was sitting on the toilet, and then my wife threw me off the toilet so she could throw up into it. Yeah, man. So the honeymoon phase is over. <laughs> gaze? I can't gaze at you. I, I can't even look at you. <laughs> I feel like we were both in a plane crash where we had to like, eat a couple of the passengers to survive. And now we're like back in the world like... <laughs> that was crazy. <laughs> well, that happened. Can't even think about you right now. Yeah. What's crazy is like we do have like a bunch of like single friends and they're young and they will have all these crazy sexual <laughs> escapades and they'll come over to our house and they'll share them. We had this like my wife's friend came over the other day and she was like, Oh my god, this guy, he gave me an orgasm so intense that I thought I was seizuring and then we had to go to the hospital. <laughs> And my wife was like, whoa. <laughs> and then she told a story about how she ordered this dresser seven months ago. <laughs> but there's been like supply line issues. And, uh, so the dresser, it's not here. It's unclear when the dresser is here. You. We have a daughter. I had sex with you. We went to the hospital. Tell her about that. <laughs> Same thing. <laughs> we had a friend come over the other day, and it, he uh, he just had a, a threesome, where it was uh, it was my friend, a lady, and then another man. Uh, and he called it the devil's threesome. It's like, I just had the devil's threesome. It's me, a lady, and another man. And I disagree. I think the devil's threesome is one man and his pregnant wife. <laughs> Doesn't that feel more devilly? A man, a woman, and an unborn child. Isn't that something the devil would be into? If we're splitting hairs. Man, my wife hated it when I called it that. I was like, hey, let's go on the old dumbbells. She's like, I'm not having sex with you anymore. And sure enough, you know. I did have a threesome recently, I haven't had like a formal threesome, but I did have, just recently have one in a uh, video game. <laughs> video games are crazy now. You can do it, you can do anything. You can like live a whole other life. You know, I like, I'm playing this video game, you can like date the characters that they wrote or whatever, and you can have, you can have sex with, with them. Well, like you can't have sex, but you can write X and then a, a guy has sex and you want uh, it's a good game. <laughs> so I'm playing this game and I've been like, I don't know, I started seeing this like witch thing. And she's written incredible. Like she's an amazing woman and I really, I connect, 
I connect with her. <laughs> she's, uh, she's amazing. And, uh, or, <laughs> I, I love her, or, or the guy who wrote her, I guess. I don't know. She's the girl for me. <laughs> so I've been dating this witch for like 20 hours or whatever. And then the six sadistic video game, it brings you to this whole other land uh, where it gives you options to like cheat on your witch wife. And uh, at first I was like conflicted. I was like, I'm not gonna cheat on this. And then I was like, what am I doing? This is a video game. I'm gonna cheat on everybody. <laughs> so I started seeing this like <laughs> elf. And I also really connect with her too. She's like, this game's, uh, this guy, whoever this guy is, man, I love these women. But then the story arc of the game, uh, like the game is like, you're sitting in a tavern and then uh, both of these two women are, they, they both walk in and I, I'm like, am I, uh, fuck. My, <laughs> my mouth got dry, I was like, God damn it, they're both here. They're gonna talk to each other, they're gonna find out about each other. Why? Why video game? <laughs> and sure enough, they start chatting with each other. And then they both approach you, and they're like, hey, we know what you've been up to. And uh, we talked it over, and uh, kind of into it. Pop! Up pops a threesome quest. Ooh. <laughs> so, I wait until my real life, actual wife goes to sleep. <laughs> kind of quiet. <laughs> Papa's gonna play the threesome quest. <laughs> Bing! The quest starts. It's a, it's a bunch of rose petals. They lead up to this, this room in the tavern. You open the door and you go in. And there the women are. And they are totally video game naked, which they don't have to do. Their tits are out. But <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. One of the girls ties my hands to the headboard. The other girl ties my feet to the footboard. I'm like, oh my God. And then they take a step back and then they're like, hey, listen, we know what you've been doing. You betrayed both of us. We're not gonna sleep with you. And that's when my real life wife chose to come out of the bedroom. She saw what's going on on the television. She's like, what is going on? And it was this really weird moment where every single woman in the room is mad at me. Oh, real and fake. They're like, you cheated on us. She's like, what is this? I'm like, it's a video game. She's like, what kind of video game is this? I'm like, yeah, what kind of video game is this? Because this wasn't on the box. It was like, fight monsters, save the kingdom. It wasn't like, adultery the game, where the final boss is your actual wife. <laughs> now she gets so suspicious anytime I'm playing any video. Like, I'm playing Donkey Kong. She's like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> Nothing, I'm a, I'm a monkey. Why's your dick out? <laughs> oh, I got used to the games I like. <laughs> My, my parents hate my act. Uh, <laughs> they hate any time I talk about anything sexual. Uh, they're like, David, no! How could you? Even though they're the ones that showed me all the, you know, all the movies like Animal House and Caddyshack and Risky Business, how could you? It's like all your favorite movies are sex comedies. <laughs> They forget, it's so easy to forget how much sex is in the movie Caddyshack. Cause you think it's like this fun golf romp or whatever. I remember when my dad showed me Caddyshack. He's like, David, this is a comedy classic. <laughs> Let's watch. Then he turned it on. Within 10 seconds, a woman just takes her top off and he had his hand on my shoulder and the room got so tense. I was like, oh my God, am I gonna kiss my dad? <laughs> I 
That's the kind of comedy they like. You know you're watching a classic comedy when both your dad are horny and afraid. I'll never achieve that with my comedy. <laughs> But uh, that's why I'm gonna end on the joke they hate the most. And uh, hey man, if you don't like it, hey, we had a fun time, yeah? <laughs> Thank you guys so much. This is, this is not really special. You guys made me special. All right, so this final joke's about uh, how my, my best friend just revealed that he can blow himself. Do you want to take back that huge applause? You just <laughs> oh no! Yeah, he just confessed it to me. Uh, David, I, I can suck my own dick. <laughs> Instead of like a murder. Uh, David, remember those missing girls from last? I can suck my own dick. <laughs> he told me how he did it. He got his feet up on the wall. Blah, 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 blah walked his limp dick into his own mouth, and he never got hard because it was uncomfortable. So he just sucked on his limp dick for a little while, and gave up, walked his feet back down, and went back to his job walking dogs. I tell you about that because I have to think about it and it shouldn't just be me. <laughs> you guys gotta think about that. I think about them when I'm like at CVS. Like I'm like, are you a CVS rewards member? And then I remember my friend sucking his own limp dick. Ah! to explain there. I have awful friends, horrible, nightmare friends. Like, the worst friends possible. I had a friend, he, all right, so he invited me to go get a burrito with him. And uh, he's like, hey Dave, do you wanna get a burrito with me? And I was like, yeah, of course, why wouldn't I want to do that? Unbeknownst to me, my friend had a two for one burrito coupon. So he just needed somebody to buy a burrito first so that he could latch his own burrito onto it, like a tick. <laughs> and a mosquito. Doesn't tell me about the coupon. So we get into the burrito place, I'm like, you can go first. He's like, no! I'm like, all right. I'll go first. Go through a whole line, order my burrito, whatever. And I, I ring up, I get it. And then he comes in after, and then uh, he doesn't want me to see the coupon, even though I'm standing right here. And he, so he just like slides it, he's like, and this burrito is with that burrito. And then the cashier looks at it, she's like, oh, I'm sorry, he already rang up his burrito, so you, I can't, I don't know how to, you're just gonna have to pay for your burrito. And then my friend said, well, but I don't have any money. And then she looked at him with this such a lost, empty look, because no one's gone through the entire burrito line before, gotten to the end and been like, oh, money? <laughs> I don't have it. He left his house in New York City with only a two-for-one burrito coupon. Imagine doing that. Like, if you get robbed with a two-for-one burrito, they'll kill you on principle. I have to do this just because I feel like that's what nature would have done. So he's like, oh, but I don't have any money. She's like, what? And he's like, you can just put it back. She's like, put it. I see this and I'm like, I will just pay for the burrito. And I'll do that every single time. Anytime something awkward comes up, I will throw you $9 to make it go away. Every time my dad brings up pronouns, I, I'll, $9, shut the fuck up. Talk about golf, stay in your lane. So I buy his burrito, and then uh, we sit down at a, a, like, whatever, table, and then uh, he's like, man, I feel really bad about that. Here, you, here, you can have the coupon. 
I was like, yeah, I'm taking your coupon. Here's, here's what I'm gonna do with your coupon. I'm gonna beg a different friend to this restaurant. I'm gonna tell them about the coupon and we're both gonna pay half price for a burrito because that's how adult friendship works. And then I look at the coupon and it is expired. So that friend's name is uh, Cameron Gillette and he's the one who can suck his own dick. <laughs> That'll be my closer until he gives me nine dollars. Thank you guys so much. It's a pleasure. So yeah, I, uh, I was complaining about my moving job to my, my manager the other day, and, uh, or I don't know if he's my manager. I, I don't know if I have a manager. Uh, I've gotten him no money, he's given me no work. <laughs> to me, a manager is a guy that buys you a sandwich once a year when you visit LA. <laughs> Which I'm not complaining. I uh, just gotta figure out those other 700 meals. Uh, <laughs> But something about this business is they are not able to tell you any sort of negative thing. I'm telling him about my move. I'm like, man, I just don't want to move anymore. He's like, you're going to make it. I'm like, what about any of this makes you think that I will make it? He's like, I got to go. You can't just tell me. So I got this email the other day, right? I was up for this television thing. It was a big deal, a lot of money. My daughter would eat. And, uh, and so we were in constant communication and then suddenly communication stopped. So I hit up my manager. I was like, hey, what's going on with this thing? I haven't heard anything for a while. And then he was like, ah, Dave, good news, bad news. Uh, bad news, the showrunner, she no longer works uh, for the network. She got a job at a uh, a very big magazine as uh, vice president of creative. So they will no longer be moving forward with you. Good news, it's a great opportunity for her. <laughs> and we're so excited to follow her on this journey. I'm like, hey, this isn't good news, bad news. This is bad news, irrelevant news. Who talks like this? Imagine going to a restaurant and you order food and then the waiter comes back and they're like, hey, good news, bad news. Uh, bad news, we do not have the sandwich you ordered. Good news, the, the chef is in love. <laughs> Isn't that what's important? Love. Not when your family's swallowing their teeth for cash. 